It has to do with patterns. And Dave Tate knows this, JL, all the top power lifters. What they're always looking for are patterns. Pain with pushing overhead. So the classic example as far as the dumbbell press, optimal technique. Biggest thing that we tend to see is the infraspinatus and the subscapularis problem. This is where we can get into nerve compression. This is uh, the suprascapular notch. You can see where the nerve comes out uh, on top there where the red arrow is, and that basically innervates the supraspinatus. Then you have the spinal glenoid notch where the nerve drops down and it, it basically innervates the infraspinatus. The top one, it's not very common that we tend to see. The bottom one, we do see it. And what does it look in real life? You'll see a hollowing of, so if someone has a shirt off and one side is you know, a lot more atrophied, a lot smaller than the other side, there could be a problem. So you ask them, can you raise your arm? So give this a try. So with your thumb up, palm forward, don't whack your partner in the head, try and bring your arm up and try and touch your, your bicep to your head. Try it on both sides. Anybody here restricted with that? Come on up. The biggest one I tend to see is the infraspinatus or the lat. That, that tends to be the problem. And especially with pressing. What happened to the shoulder? No, just tight. just tight. So no pain. No pain. This is important. He doesn't have pain, but there is some tightness. So that's basically called a dysfunction. Can we help that? I don't know. One of the other aspects is that he has a lot of muscle. So it may just be, he's not able to do it just because he has so much muscle here. So that's a little tight. His anterior delt is banging into his masseter there. And that's tight there. Okay, so this is the self-test. A lot of times when, so try and do a shoulder press. So he can actually keep it in line, but he can't go, that's about as high as you can go. Okay, where do you feel the tension? Here in the mid-back area. So he can't bring it up as much. Photo, okay, good. So we're going to do the infraspinatus muscle test on this one. The infraspinatus, um, if there's any restriction, you won't be able to bring your arm down as far. He's actually pretty good. You can bring it down 45 degrees. This here. He's got actually good range of motion here. Really good on this side. How's the pack? Excellent. So he's only tight in this one area where he can't bring it up as high. So we're going to muscle test the infraspinatus to see whether or not that's the culprit. So the way that it's done is that he's going to try and externally rotate his arm backwards into my hand. Push backward. Push backward. And that's a little bit weak. Push downward. That's strong. Was that painful when he did that? Backwards, yeah. Backwards it was. Push backward. Yeah, it's a little weak. Push down, and that's strong. Okay, so let's see if this works. I'm not attached to whether or not this works. I'm just interested to see if it does work. That's the problem. If you have a whole bunch of things that you can do, you can always substitute it for something else. So this is the actual, so I want, to t I want him to do the exercise. So we did the subscapularis in this one for the bench press. In this position here, we're going to do the infraspinatus. So what I want you to do is push forward into my hand and push backward. Push forward, push backward, push forward, push backward. See, this tends to work for if it's just tight and you can't do it, or if you just had surgery a year ago. Push forward, 
Oh shit. Push back. Okay. Let's see if this made a difference. Bring this here. Push backward. Better. Let's see if it made a difference as far as the range of motion. That's better, eh? That's great. Okay, let's fix the other side. Push backward. Push that back forward. Push back. Not as hard, not as hard. Push forward. Could he do this himself? Absolutely. Could you do this with all other techniques? 100%. You could do this with active release. You can do this with any mobility work. It doesn't matter. This is an inclusionary aspect. Not This is the only thing that you need to do. So if you're already doing stuff, continue doing it. Let's see if that made a difference. Even better. Try doing a shoulder press now. Is that better? Yeah, that is better. His, his upper pec is banging into his jaw. So like I said, what size do you take? Double. Double. I got a double. I got one double. There we go. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. So treatment for that. This would us. so if it didn't release, would I go in on the infraspinatus and lat and do active release? Absolutely. Could I use the percussor on that? Yes. Could we probably get more range of motion out of him? Probably a few more degrees, but he can already raise it up pretty good, a lot better than before. The problem is, is that if he gets into this state and all of a sudden the shoulder pain starts to show up because the dysfunction was already there. Yes, sir. Come on up. Is this helpful? Okay, good. So what specifically were you thinking of? My left inter hip internal rotation is awful. So show me what you mean by that. Everyone has their own interpretation. So people go, oh yeah, my shoulder really hurts, and they touch their chest. So, here's, so, my, here's my right. Okay. Here's my left. Try it again. Left. Okay. So, and so, what happened? Uh, recently, uh, tweaked my back squatting. Tweaked your back squatting. Okay. Do you guys mind? Done it, Would a, couple, you? done it a couple times, but more recently. Okay. Eight weeks ago. Bring your leg up. So I'm just going to check the rectus femoris. Push up my hand. It's good. I think you don't want me to hold on the chair. Oh, it doesn't matter. Okay. Hold. <laughs> Try it again. Hold. So it's a little bit weak. Bring your foot up. So I'm going to test the anterior tibialis. Hold. Keep your foot up. Bring your toes up towards your nose. Hold. Keep your foot up. Hold. That's weak. Bring this up. Hold. <coughs> Bring this up. Hold. Okay. Bring this here. Push up my hand. Hold. It's good. Bring this up. Hold. Not so good. Okay. So the entire leg is not working. Here's the key. If you have so do you get plantar fasciitis at all? No. I'm flat footed as hell though. So do you have any foot pain, any else, knee? No. Just that one area. So why would his, here's the kicker. If there's nothing else that you walk out of here, it's this. Why would it only be his right side? <coughs> Something else happened on that side. The weight training exercise did not create this exercise or this injury. It exposed it. I see so many people coming in and they say, you know what, my right shoulder hurt. What happened? Five years ago I was skiing, landed on my shoulder, it got better, started a weight training program, and all of a sudden when I'm starting to bench, my right shoulder showed up. In everyday life, wouldn't have bothered them. You put you know, 200 pounds on a bench, it starts to show up. So something else is going on. So in a seated position here, it shows up. Let's have you on your back. Now, I went from an axial load where he's squatting, pressure on that, to now where he's on his back here. So let's test his strength 
and see if it makes a difference. Bend your knee, hold, push this way. That's better. This here. Sorry, I weigh as much as a small child. Doesn't matter. Push up, straight, 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 straight. Push up my hand. Does that feel different? A little bit, yeah. Yeah, a little stronger? Yeah. Bring your foot up, hold, keep, bring your toes up. And that's stronger. So have you take a seat again. Bring this up, hold, and it comes back. What, what's the difference? I loaded his spine. So we're probably looking at a lumbar situation where he's having pain, where he's having pain in that area. So if you, have, if you start to shut down on these different type of exercises, what would be helpful for him? Traction. Let's have you on your back. Can you come on up? To bring your arms up, just like this. So I just want you to hold them here. Sheena, if you hurt me. <laughs> just hold on. So I'm going to traction his low back with not very much force. So I'm going to take him above the knee. You don't need to go down here because I could cause some problems in the knee problem. I'm going to go above the knee, let it relax. And all I'm going to do is just traction. So he could lay on a table and I could even change the angle. The further out that I bring the leg, the further down the lumbar spine. What would this be good for? Disc injury. If I bring it out further, now I'm around L5. If I'm here, I'm probably about L1. How's that feel? Feels good. Can you do this yourself? No. Come on up. Could you do it hanging? It would be helpful. What about those contraptions where you hang upside down? Thank you. You're what size do you take? Um, large. There you go. Yeah. Welcome. Bring up this. Push up. Better? Yes. Bring this up. Hold. Better? Push up, better. Stand up. How's that feel? Feels good. Better? Yeah. Matt wasn't having any pain, but it does feel like it's. It's a little bit looser. Yeah, lumbar Did, lumbar. So this is something that you could easily have your training partner do or anything else. If you have a previous disc injury, and it's a simple test, you can just see whether or not they can actually hold it, or you can watch them squat. If they're like this and they're kind of shifting off to one side, or it's buckling in all the time. You can traction, see if it makes a difference. What size? Medium. There you go. Awesome. Yay. Thank you. So rehab. You saw the isometrics that I did with the gentleman here? Yes, yeah, you had a question. The question is, if you have a healthy athlete, would this be helpful? Yes, but the, the whole thing that I've learned, and this is what's happened in the strength and training world, is where, I don't know if this is happening in the United States, but up in Canada, so many of the trainers, whether they're strength and conditioning coaches or personal trainers, are starting to become therapists. So all of a sudden, in the hour session, it's now turned into a half hour of fascial stretching and mobility and trying to fix all the different things instead of going, let's make you the best athlete or make you, you know, if you're 300 pounds and you're five foot two female that's 40 years old, fascial stretching, really? Let's, let's do some stuff to get your cardio working. Let's get some stuff to get you your, your metabolic rate working, whatever way that you want to do. Let's talk about nutrition, which is probably the biggest issue. I've yet to see a healthy athlete, and I think everything can be improved. The challenge being is that your diagnostic skills have to be at, at, at a much, much higher level. Case in point. So you start doing what I qualify as sort of out-of-the-box thinking. And we have Dr. Serrano that probably is one of the best out-of-the-box thinkers as far as looking at this. We have another one that always shows up who's socially awkward. Who here has been to Swiss? Uh, Dr. Leaf, socially awkward? 
Yeah, yeah. Super brilliant guy. So he had, and I, I forget what year this was, uh, might have been 88, 92. So he works on a lot of Olympic athletes. So the guy was uh, from Europe was supposed to win the marathon, 26 mile for the Olympics. He had such bad shin splints that he couldn't run five miles. So he flew to Boston and he said, uh, Dr. Leaf, you know, can you assess me? He says, sure, bring your shorts and also your runners. He says, okay. So he, he goes in, so Dr. Leaf, he muscle tests, he fixes stuff, uses the percussor adjustments, whole nine yards. He says, okay, I want you to go run five miles. He had a separate room and he had a table in his x-ray uh, room. And he says, uh, as soon as you finish running five miles, figure it out how far it is, come back in, I want you to run right into that room. As soon as you're in that room, my staff will alert me and I'll come in and I'll test. All the, other, all the muscles that he had originally uh, tested were actually strong, but a whole new set had shown up as weak. So he fixed those and he says, go run another five miles. And he got him up and literally within two weeks, he got him so that he could run 30 miles. He didn't stay at 26, he went all the way up to 30. Why? Because you want to run through the actual end part. He actually won the gold medal in Olympic, going from literally couldn't even run, but different things start to break down. And I saw this, and it has to do with patterns. And Dave Tate knows this, JL, all the top powerlifters. What they're always looking for are patterns. What do you look like? So uh, Dr. Leaf was up in Toronto. He, uh, I was going to take him to the airport after the seminar. Afterwards, we're grabbing something to eat before we uh, take it. The Boston Marathon. Dave's from Boston. So he's watch we're watching the uh, last mile. Of, of the Boston Marathon, and he's watching it, and he goes, the guy in third's gonna win. And I go, how do you know that? He says, I just know. I said, five bucks, you're wrong. I said, the other guy in first is way too strong. He says, you're on. So all of a sudden, the guy in third won. I said, what did you see? He said, everyone else was running sideways. When they're running, they were going from side to side, showing that they already had the fatigue pattern. The guy in third, didn't. And he said, that guy has another gear. And the guy in third had won. He was able to do it. So this is what we always see. What are the patterns? So when you're working with your athletes, guess what? Stuff doesn't show up. If you're benching 400, it won't show up at 225, 300, even 350. But 375, you start seeing weird stuff. That's where it becomes important. And the cool part now is, now you can assess them at that point. You know what? Yeah, you were strong here all this other time, and all of a sudden, it broke apart. One guy that I'm working with right now, Ken Wetham, uh, works with uh, uh, Dave as far as the lead FTS, is a, a writer for them. He came in uh, last year at 400 pounds, he had excruciating back pain. And he'd seen a lot of good people. So when he took off his shirt, I said, what the heck is that? He goes, what? He had a scar from here all the way down to here. He says, oh, that, that was 20 years ago. I picked up an air conditioner and it cut me here. So I tested abdominal wall. His, his right oblique didn't work at all. Now this is a guy that actually was able to squat 840 um, at the world's previous, but he was in a lot of pain. You're able to do it, but you can't progress. So I treated it with the MPS uh, Dolphin. We did some laser work. We did some acupuncture and a number of other things. All of a sudden, the oblique started to kick in because I was treating everything else and I was getting okay results. As soon as I treated this, it kicked in. And it doesn't show up until it starts to, um, um, until you actually force it. Do you see the same thing, Dave? You don't see patterns, like you can do it easy, light, but once it gets heavy, you start falling apart. Yeah. So this is the external rotation for um, uh, the infraspinatus. Lateral arm abduction. So laterals. The reason why this is, I'm talking about this one, is this is very common with a lot of the sports, especially in football, rugby, everything else. And this is the AC joint sprain. So what we have is in the upper left-hand corner, is a normal AC joint. Grade one, there's more grades now, but this is for simplicity. Grade one is a mild uh, strain in that area, mild tearing. 
Grade two is now you're starting to get a little bit of step deformity through here. And in grade three is literally, you see this in rugby players, football players, where the entire clavicle is starting to pop up. And you can still bench heavy if you even have a grade three AC uh, joint sprain. It's just that you have to do a number of things and have to have a strong enough uh, shoulder in order to carry it. So one of the things that you can do is to see whether or not you can bring the arm all the way up. And if you can't, you know something is going on. This is the test. Who here has a, a um, AC problem? Come on up. Did I answer your question? Yes. Yeah. So I would use it for your high-end athletes. I would definitely use it for that. So what are you feeling? Um, I separated this one uh, like seven years ago. Seven years ago. But incline, incline, any incline press bothers it, incline bench press. Incline bench press. Yep. Okay. So I'm just going to go back to what I've been doing all day. This, all you guys can do this. That's easy. It's got good range of motion. Awesome. External rotation, it's good. Bring this here and here. So I'm just gonna test the lateral deltoid here and see whether or not it fires properly. So I'm testing this aspect, the top part of his shoulder. I want you to push up, hold. That is strong. Bring this up, push up. Push up, and that's a little bit weak. So what would you do with this? Now, the other thing that he said is that the uh, incline press, correct? Incline um, uh, bench press? Yeah. So this is the muscle test for the bench press. I, if I want to test the incline aspect, I bring it up to 45 degrees. So push into my hand, hold. He's good here. If I test him here. Push up, hold, not as good. Now, let's test the bench press position. Push here, hold, strong. Bring this up, hold, goes weak. Why did that occur? I have absolutely no idea. I'm being completely honest here. And so I'm working more and more with neurologists. And this is the aspect of there's different planes and ranges of motion from a neurological standpoint that can be inhibitory. Here he's fine. Here basically goes. So can, can you test him again with the eyes closed? Okay, close your eyes. Same position here. Yeah. Hold. Still weak. On the bench press, eyes still closed. Okay. Eyes still closed. Push in. Strong. Push up, still weak. What can happen a lot of times if you have eyes open, eyes closed, it accesses different parts of the brain. So that's always a good call. So this is the acromioclavicular joint sprain test. What I'm going to do, I'm gonna see whether or not this will be helpful. I'm gonna take my index finger and put it on his clavicle, and I'm gonna put on the spine of the scapula the, my thumb. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to pinch it together. I want to support this section right here, which is the AC joint, which he said he hurt, what, seven years ago? So if I bring it here, I take my hand, my index finger, just on the anterior portion of the clavicle, and now this, um, the spine of the scapula, and now I'm going to just squeeze it together. See if it makes a difference. Hold. Better. Bring this up. Hold, bring it across, yeah, and that's better. If I take my hand off, hold, go in, it goes weak. So we know that there's something going on here. He already told us, but what can we do for that? Now, in the gym, it would look really funny for me to stand there beside him and very expensive, so, one of the things you can do 
is you can get some tape. This is kinesio tape, rock tape. There's lots of companies out. And what you would do is just tape it like that. Mind if we just roll this up? Let's see if it makes a difference. Gonna go right over top. I'm gonna squeeze it together as I'm doing this. It's a little bit too long, but that's fine. It's all the way down your tricep, part of your shirt. Good. Okay, bring that down. See if it makes a difference. Push up. Push up. Better. Push in. Hold. Good. Does that feel stronger? So that can be helpful in that area. I have extra large. <laughs> there we go. Thank you. Oh, thank you. Thanks. We're done? Five minutes? Yeah, I'm almost done here. So for rehab, you can do some of the lateral stuff. Now, from a chiropractic, we haven't even gotten into that. Don't necessarily need to here. Uh, so you always want to check the AC, uh, sternoclavicular joint, glenohumeral joint, check cervical spine, check the thoracic spine. Here's the one thing for the chiropractors in here. This is out of grieve. This is the T4 syndrome. This is the number one problem subluxation wise or upper back wise that I see with people that bench press. Because if you think about it, it's just your upper back on the bench and all the weight is on top of you. So in that area, this can cause a tremendous amount of stress, which can neurologically inhibit th this down. A lot of people will adjust in the cervical area and even the shoulder joint, but they really won't do anything in the upper back area, and that can cause a joint dysfunction. And these are the normal areas that we would see. So you would want to do an adjustment, whether it's laying down, such as in this position here, um, here, where you could adjust it. I do a standing wall adjustment, but I tend to do it in flexion, and it works really, really well. This here is very, very interesting. Um, there's a number of people that have chronic mid-back pain, and no matter what they do, this is interesting as far as consumption of brewed coffee. A common cause of re reoccurring fixation in the mid-thoracic spine, which is this area here, in between a shoulder blade has been linked to coffee drinking. The linkage, says Gillet, was first reported by Illy, whose investigation found that one, each patient has a personal threshold, one to 10 cups of coffee, of which additional cups consumed would bring a hypertonic state and fixation of T4 to T8, including the attachment rims. It was also discovered it was not the caffeine. It wasn't the caffeine. It was the con uh, content of the coffee that was responsible, but the burnt oil of the coffee bean in the burn-in process during the roasting. Certain brands of coffee especially appear to be uh, dangerous because the oils are added to the coffee. And we're starting to see this. So the darker, the more roasted it is. And a lot of times you'll see, and it's, I've actually personally felt it, that if you drink a lot of coffee, the mid-back tends to tighten up. So everyone has their own threshold. I had one patient, she came in, she had exploratory surgery um, on her stomach because she had st stomach pains and she uh, couldn't sleep. So um, I said, well, fill out this diet survey. Obviously people have asked you what you ate. And uh, she goes, no, no one's ever asked me. And I went, they did exploratory surgery on your stomach. And no one asked you, no. So she filled it out and it came back and I went, is this right? She goes, what? It says eight pots of coffee. And I went, okay, this must be one of those little hotel pots, you know, that one cup. I said, well, how much is in a pot? Eight cups. So I asked her, I said, how did you get 64 cups of coffee into you every day? She says, well, I have a coffee maker on my uh, desk. So that's all I drink all day. So I said, okay, can you bring it down to about five? A day? She says, oh yeah. I said, is this a habit or just something that you need? She says, oh no, it's a habit. I said, bring it down. Because if I had brought her down to zero, it would have killed her because of the adrenal aspect. <laughs> and all of a sudden, her, she was able to sleep and her stomach pain went away. 
So even the most simplistic things, like let's, let's take a look at what you eat and, and you know, how you function in that area can make a difference. If you need to contact me, this is my personal email address.